Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have with us is Griselda Arroyo Chavez and Enrique Vasquez Samadeni. Hi, Frank. Hello, Hi, everybody. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Griselda, where are you located at? Yeah, well, here, Morelia, the weather begins warmer and warmer. <laughs> <laughs> And with the arrival of spring, also allergies arrive. Okay. So it's cold. <laughs> are you in, so what, what city are you in? What town are you in? Morelia. Morelia. Okay. Mm -hmm. so that yeah, that's about uh, maybe 200 miles west of Mexico City. Okay. In, in Mexico, yeah. Uh, beautiful colonial city. Yeah. We would welcome everybody to come and visit. It's yeah. a real view. It's it's uh -huh. even uh, World Heritage. Uh, the downtown no, has actually. been declared World very Heritage. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Very um, nice. Hey, you guys will have to put on a conference there and come on down. Actually, we did, uh, we did a few uh -huh. years ago, but uh, <laughs> and the people are asking for another there was one. one. Well, people, uh, yeah. Uh, you, so, but probably you haven't had one for like two years or so. Right? No, not in two years. No, yeah, no, no. Okay. I, I was on star formation. The next time one comes out, <laughs> I'm going to be asking on the on perfect, the, perfect. The yeah, no, I, this was five years ago. It'd be very cool. Yeah, that's yeah. in my bit bucket. I will make it down. Mm -hmm. Very good. Zelda, you have some pretty awesome artwork there over your left shoulder there. What are those? <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm such an artist in my free time, but now I cool. don't have a free time, so I try to combine <laughs> my work to the art, making beautiful presentations. <laughs> That's the point, yeah. It's a different kind of art. <laughs> yeah, 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 but well, it makes it work. <laughs> I smell somebody's PhD thesis coming up. <laughs> exactly. Well, I look forward to calling you Dr. Arroyo Chavez. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Uh, Enrique, what do you like to do for research? Well, actually, I've been doing uh, turbulence and star formation for all of my career. Uh -huh. uh, so I went to grad school in Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, I finished uh, over 30 years ago, so <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> just, yesterday. Uh, just yesterday. Just yesterday, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, my, my supervisor was John Scalin. He was a person very much into nonlinear uh, things and turbulence and all that. And, and so, and it fascinated me. So that's what I've been doing. Cool. But lately I've been fascinated by the nonlinearity of gravitational collapse. Okay. Uh, that that is something we're not used to thinking about it's uh you know it's anything but what we normally imagine as a single thing just collapsing mm -hmm. it becomes it, it develops you know multi-scale and uh, multi-time scale structures and so yeah. it's just beautiful it's a it's a really fascinating topic and that's what i've been doing the last few years i like beautiful things beautiful things <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right. In Griselda, since it was just yesterday for Enrique, it must be just tomorrow for you. My whole life, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah, well, in my case, I'm a PhD student. I, of course, I work with Professor Enrique Vasquez. <laughs> mm -hmm. We are currently interested in, in the angular momentum transport at molecular cloud scales to core scales sure. and its implications for the fragmentation process. We focus mainly on the famous angular momentum problem, which I will talk about later, mm -hmm. and which is also the central topic in, in our paper. Cool, which is gonna bring us right to it. Mm -hmm. So we are going to go over this very lovely APJ, open access. You can get it if you want, folks. Uh, evolution of the angular momentum during gravitational fragmentation of molecular clouds. And Griselda and Enrique, take us away. Perfect. Chris. Perfect. OK. Mm -hmm. So as I said before, this paper explores the angular momentum problem, or AMP. Uh, this is a problem that has been around since the 70s, and that was also seen in observations in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So here, uh, the introduction compiles some of the evidence of this problem and the interpretations that some authors have given over the years. But well, this problem has not been fully resolved, and that is why papers continue to come out about it, <laughs> like this one. But what is this uh, problem about? It 
can be seen in the plot of the magnitude of the specific angular momentum of a clump versus the clump radius, like in figure one in the next page. And uh, just as a note, the most usual way to understand a clump is as a density peak in scales of a parsec. But well, in this word, we will use the word clumps to refer to all the fragments in general in the range uh, of the scales in this plot. Okay. from fractions of parsecs to tens of parsecs. Mm -hmm. And well, here in figure one, we made a compilation of different observational samples for the specific angular momentum, this little j, and the radius r. And as you can see, uh, the larger clumps uh, on the top right uh, have a specific angular momentum, several orders of magnitude greater than the course on the bottom left, then the problem arises when we think that the smaller fragments at the bottom left are the result of a monolithic collapse. That is, that all the material uh, of the complete cloud collapses to form a core. Yes. Since, well, in that case, by conservation of angular momentum, we should see a constant trend here instead of a loss of angular momentum. Mm -hmm. So this is the famous angular momentum problem. And as solutions, magnetic braking or gravitational torques have been proposed as mechanisms to remove angular momentum from molecular clouds. Mm -hmm. But it is not clear uh, which, is, which mechanism dominates this process. So we discussed this uh, in equation eight, uh, which uh, represents the, yeah, which represents the, the momentum uh, equation for fluids in cross product with the position vector equivalent to the usual way to compute the angular momentum as r cross b. Mm -hmm. But uh, here uh, using the, the momentum equation for fluids instead of the linear momentum. So here on the right hand side, we have the active torques, including uh, magnetic and gravitational contributions, uh, which are the most common mechanisms uh, used to solve the angular momentum problem. But we also see other uh, contributions such, such as uh, viscous torque. And in the first two terms, we yeah. have the, the torque due to the RAM pressure gradient or and due to the thermal gradient. And also the first term is uh, related with the eddy viscosity. So this is the motivation of this, of this paper is uh, explore this problem, taking into account these other terms uh, and from the global hierarchical collapse model, which is actually the model that is uh, developed in our group, in which well, the, cl the clouds are not supported against the, their own cell gravity, but they are in free fall. And actually in our group, this uh, project about the specific <laughs> angular momentum is known as the, as the Jinx project. <laughs> Enrique can tell you the story behind that name. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a funny anecdote uh, because, you know, Greece, Greece wasn't the first one to get uh, this problem uh, as a suggested thesis topic. Okay. But it turned out that two other guys came first and they dropped out. <laughs> so when she approached me looking for a project, I said, okay, here's one that has a sort of jinx on it, but, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I, I trust that you can uh, overcome this jinx. <laughs> and, and so she did. So here's the paper. No? So, that's, the paper. <laughs> uh, so uh, at least that part was, was very good. But, very cool. but yeah, so the first talk uh, Grace gave about this, this paper, actually, the title was The Jinxed Project <laughs> for, mm -hmm. our, for our, any, anyway. But uh, the, the one thing that I, more seriously, I, I would like to just briefly touch on is this uh, model of global hierarchical collapse that our, okay. our group has been promoting in the last few years, mm -hmm. because it is a departure from our, our standard knowledge uh, about uh, molecular clouds. Uh, normally, we tend to think that molecular clouds are in some sort of equilibrium, uh, either supported by magnetic fields or by turbulence or uh, whatever. Right. But we've been doing simulations of molecular clouds for a long time and combining them with turbulence. And when we try to, to come up with self-consistent evolutionary simulations of the formation of molecular clouds that included the mechanism for driving the internal turbulence in them, we found that uh, 
the internal turbulence was not enough to support the clouds. And uh, so the clouds just began to undergo gravitational collapse as soon as they became genes unstable. So, uh, and so that's what we've been we've been doing. And uh, uh, Greece's thesis is uh, embedded in this general scenario of clouds that are not supported. They're just formed by whatever compressions happen in, in the diffuse warm gas in the galaxy. Okay. And the clouds form by assembly, by collection of gas, and this drives the turbulence inside them, but then begin to contract. And then uh, until they begin forming stars and then they get destroyed by the star formation. And so Gris's thesis is uh, within the context of, of this scenario. And she has been looking at whether uh, clouds undergoing this mechanism and hierarchical gravitational fragmentation actually uh, can help us understand the origin of this uh, angular momentum problem. Cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, well, then to finish the, the introduction, uh, we will study this problem, the, the EMP problem, uh, using an ASPH simulation. Uh, simulation of smoother particles. Uh -huh. Since due to the characteristic of these uh, simulations, we can uh, tag particle by particle that make up a clump to see how the specific angular momentum and also the radius evolve. So that's the point. And as Enrique just said, uh, we are going to work with a, a GHC simulation in which the clouds evolve in a self-consistent way. Uh -huh. uh, first formed uh, by some kind of compressions, but not having any restrictions uh, to be supported again their self gravity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So about so what we did regarding the strategy that we followed in section uh, four point one, for example, uh, mm -hmm. you can find here the simulation that we used. Mm -hmm. Again, a SPH simulation about the formation and collapse of the ion molecular clouds. Here, uh, well, the numerical box has uh, 259 parsecs per side. Mm -hmm. We have of, of the order of 10 to the 6 particles uh, with a mass of 0 0.06 solar masses each. And this sorry, simulation... Yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry, yeah, just, uh, I, I think... Uh, uh, Greece read the numbers a little bit off. Uh, so it's actually 26 million particles, you know? And we have uh, about yeah. 1.6 solar, million solar masses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. And well, this uh, simulation includes mm -hmm. uh, prescription for sinks and cooling ups also, but mm -hmm. does not contain stellar feedback. That's important. So we choose a certain period in the simulation where we had enough dense structures formed, but not too many things. Okay. And uh, using a clump finding algorithm that define clumps as connected particles above a density threshold, we create a numerical sample of clumps like those in figure three, for example. So yeah, here in uh, yeah, the next. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. So here uh, in figure three, we show five examples of clones with the five density threshold that we chose from 10 to the three to 10 to the five particles per cubic centimeter. Mm -hmm. And well, as you can see, well, the less dense uh, clones at the top tend to have a more elongated shape compared, to, compared with the densest ones. And well, from the complete sample, we selected a few clumps to track them in time. These clumps are uh, those in table one in the previous page. <laughs> All good. And she knows it by heart, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. <laughs> uh, and from this table, table one, uh, I would like to highlight the, the two types of tracking that we did. So clumps uh, with a mark in the fourth column that we call as Lagrangian sets uh, refer to the fact that we always follow the same set of particles that is at constant mass. Mm -hmm. And here we only apply the clump finding algorithm at the definition time. So then the particles are able to disperse. Mm -hmm. Compare, well, while uh, the clumps defined as connected particles are each time step, 
uh, are able to grow in mass and size and exchange particles with their surroundings. So, well, finally, in the last two columns, uh, we wanted to follow uh, clumps from the past uh, to see uh, where they come from, but also towards the future mm -hmm. to see what happens to them. Cool. So, so here we have these two ways of, to track clumps from the past and to the future. Mm -hmm. And at each time step, we uh, compute the size and the angular momentum with respect to their center of mass to put them in the uh, specific angular momentum versus radius plot. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the idea. So uh, as a first result uh, for the full sample uh, in figure four, for example, uh, for the case of the full sample uh, here, uh, we have all the clumps where the colors uh, refers just to the density threshold that we use to define them. Mm -hmm. And the symbols refers to the definition time. But as you, as you can see, the fitting to the numerical sample uh, here with the red line uh, agrees very well with the black line uh, that represents the, the fitting to the compilation of observational samples that, that we made in figure one. And it's practically the same slope. Yeah. So as a first uh, conclusion, we can say that a GHC simulation can reproduce uh, the observational trend very well, actually very, very well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's uh, as a first, uh, as a first uh, conclusion. So the next- Maybe, uh, uh -huh. I, I would like to just comment uh, briefly. I don't know if it was clear. We actually computed a large sample of clumps in the simulation. Uh -huh. From those, we selected a few that are the ones listed in table one, it for which we did the tracking for. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And all the other ones we didn't, the rest of them, we didn't track in time. We just plotted in this in, in this figure. But so the, this, the whole sample consists of many more clumps than the ones in, in table one. And that's why you see so many points here in this plot, no? So this is like a, just like a one snapshot, well, several snapshots, but we didn't do the tracking, no? We just did like uh, instantaneous uh, identification of the clumps in, in the simulation at different times, at the times indicated over there. Uh -huh. uh, and then we just tracked a few of them, okay, over time. Okay. Because it because it was a you know it, it was not automatized or anything, uh, so it, Gris did it you know following them and <laughs> and investigating time step by time step time step. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. let me ask a, a question here then. So then uh, in in uh, J versus R, this is essentially a time sequence. Mm -hmm. Uh, not answer? exactly. Yeah, no, yeah. not exactly. We here we define clumps, uh, for example, in uh, four different uh, snapshots of the simulation. Okay. And then uh, again, here uh, every point oh. represents clumps. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's like we have the the, the we simulators have the luxury of having the time dimension. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it, uh, we were observing the simulation at four different times Got and it. computed uh, and then just extracted the clumps mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and plotted those clumps, all of the clumps, taking different times as different samples mm -hmm, yeah. and plotted all of them here. I'm with you yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so well, the next uh, thing that we want to mention is about the following to the futures that, that we want. So Enrique is going to <laughs> okay. Okay. say something about it. <laughs> okay, yeah, so... Um, Actually, we're going to skip a little, uh, the section on, on following the clumps from the past into the present, because uh, although it's interesting, it's not the most interesting part. No? <laughs> uh, it, it just gave us like a clue to understand what was going on. But uh, probably what's most interesting is what happened when we started tracking the, the clumps to the future. So um, then we can go to figure nine, for example. Let's go to the figure. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a big figure. I'm going to shrink it, but I'll just. Mm -hmm. one. Okay. Yeah. Right. Perhaps you can show uh, uh, line by line because it refers to the evolution uh, of different clumps mm -hmm, uh, over some time uh, temporal interval. Mm -hmm. 
Amazing. right? And, and so like, like Grisella was saying, uh, we define the clumps just as connected sets of particles above uh, some density threshold. So the, uh, the top figure, the top row shows the, uh, the evolution of a clump initially defined, if I remember, at, at a ten density to uh, 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 10 to the three, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so basically this is showing the evolution over a little bit over a million years, right? Yes. But what's, so what we found that was very interesting here is that, uh, for example, on the top left, you see that all of the, uh, all of the particles, each, each little dot is an SPH particle. Okay. Uh -huh. And all of the particles, of course, they were defined at a density of 10 to the three. So all of them, they're colored by their individual density. And so of course they're all orange, right? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. These clumps are all gravitationally contracting. Got it. And so they form denser gas. So as you go to the right, you see uh, bluer colors, colors arising. Uh -huh. The surprising thing was what we also saw some red colors appearing. Mm -hmm. So even though this was a clump defined initially as being above a density of a thousand, yeah. mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, towards the end, part of it has contracted and become denser, but part of it has dispersed away. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of strange. So we said, oh, best per perhaps it's just because it's a low density clump. It's only a thousand particles per cubic centimeter, but we repeated it. Uh, and then the next row shows the same for clumps defined at 3000 degrees, was it correct? Yeah. So as de uh, uh, at densities of 3000 particles per cubic centimeter. Uh -huh. I'm waiting. But you see, and, and you see the same thing happening. Mm -hmm. So some bluer colors arise. So showing that there's some uh, contraction, some part of the clump is getting denser, it's contracting gravitationally, but some red points are, are appear. Mm -hmm. So this guy is also losing some of its mass and it's losing it in the sense that its outskirts are becoming less dense. Mm -hmm. And the same happened uh, at higher density. So if you can go lower, mm -hmm. right? And this one was defined at a density of 10 to the four, right, initially. Mm -hmm. That was what the orange color represents now. And again, so we go to the, uh, to the final uh, snapshot and you see denser gas, but also you see that the surroundings are getting dispersed. Mm -hmm. uh, they're lowering their density and, and they're getting more scattered. Mm -hmm. And even the same happens at a density of three times to, uh, what was the last density, Chris? Uh, three times 10 to the mm -hmm. four and the last 10 to the five. 10 to the five. And even when you define the clump at 10 to the five, you would think, oh man, this thing is totally, uh, totally gravitationally bound. No, it's a 10 to the five particles per cubic centimeter. Mm -hmm. Regardless of that, it still develops some uh, particle, some parts of it that become less dense and are dispersed. So the so you see that the, uh, there's a, on the top left of the last uh, figure on the right, not top, yeah, sort of the top left, you see some dark colors. So that's the densest part. But then like, it's like the right, uh, lower right part of the, of the core on the, on, the, on the extreme right figure mm -hmm. is becoming less dense. Right. So that is very surprising, no? Uh, it's like, no matter what, there is nothing like a hum, uh, hum, monolithic collapse here. Part of the clump is always getting dispersed. Mm -hmm. That was the beauty of, of tracking the particles individually so that we know what's happening to the particles exactly. And so what we thought is, we owe this to one of our colleagues, Javier Ballesteros Paredes. Uh, he said, uh, man, this looks like, just like what happens in accretion disks. Mm -hmm. Now in, in accretion disks, we know that uh, the, the central parts contract, uh, but part of the mass leaves carrying away the angular momentum. And so this is what seems to be happening here. And so um, the uh, plot number 13, uh, figure 13, shows how it tested this. Mm -hmm. Fig 13, there we go. Let's pull that up a little bit. Okay, perfect. Do it global. Okay. And so, uh, well, I've talked much. Do you want to talk about this, Chris? Because I, I've already mentioned this. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, go for, okay. yeah, for mm -hmm. example, here, uh, 
we separate the dense part of the clump and the less dense part. So, for example, the dense part, uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, the, the line with the, la the green dots and the less dense part with the, the, the yellow or orange, uh, orange dot. And uh, the first road is about uh, just separating uh, up and below three times ten to the, to the tree, particles per cubic centimeter. And the last road, we separate uh, the, the clump uh, above and less than uh, three times 10 to the four. You can see 10 to the fourth. Yep. Yeah. So, and uh, if we separate, well, no matter what kind of separation <laughs> uh, we did, we always see how as time, how as time passes, the dense part, so the green uh, dots, uh, loses angular momentum, which is the first column. The first column is the uh, this uh, little j. No, so the, is the actually the, the first row. Actually the, yeah, the first row, not the top row. Do you yeah. Mean? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a uh, as time passes, the dense part uh, loses angular momentum, mm -hmm. and the less dense part increases its angular momentum. So the the less dense uh, part are taking away uh, this angular momentum. So in order that the, the rest of the material is able to collapse. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening here. Very cool. Very yes. cool. Okay. And, and yeah, and basically, so this is, uh, and then what we were looking for is what is the mechanism that uh, is responsible for this exchange of angular momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, because in our, uh, in our community, you know, the star formation community, uh, it is normally thought, you know, the classical or canonical uh, mechanism that is invoked for this is uh, gravitational torques. So the suggestion, it was made by Larson in 1984, so it's, it's already the classic, you know, <laughs> uh, is that little clumps exert gravitational and tidal torques on others, and that's what causes the exchange of angular momentum. But what we found is that Actually, and this for this we could go back. I think now is the time to go back to uh, to Figure Seven, for example. Yeah. And this is what we learned by following the track the clumps from the past. So Figure Seven shows the uh, the evolution of over time for several clumps mm -hmm, defined, at, defined at different density thresholds. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's the evolution of a ratio. Which ratio? The ratio of uh, the number of particles that belong to the set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which one is on top, Chris? Uh, Chris the the uh, ratio of number intruder particles uh -huh, uh -huh. to the total number of particles. To the total. Uh -huh. So you see, because when we follow the clumps from the past, uh, we defined the, the clump as, as a connected set at a given location uh -huh, uh, in, in, in time. So we went back in time and at the, you know, maybe a couple of million years be before, mm -hmm. these particles were sort of scattered around, not connected, not everywhere connected, and they had what we called intruder particles in between. Yeah. Uh -huh. Because these are SPH particles, so the, uh, the clump is coming from the past and is getting assembled. Mm -hmm. But in the past, it was more dispersed. And so because it was dispersed, the other SPH particles that do not belong to the clump were interspersed within them. Okay. And so what this is showing is that the three clumps on the top mm -hmm. are the ones that at some point in their evolution, they underwent uh, an evolution in the... Uh, JR diagram, the uh, specific angular momentum versus size, mm -hmm. parallel to the observations. Okay. And the ones at the bottom didn't. Okay. Am I, am I right, Chris? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So that means that when you have more or a, a large enough number of particles in, you know, interspersed within the volume where the clump particles were located in the past, they were able to exchange angular momentum with this complementary set of particles and therefore lose angular momentum. Mm -hmm. Once the particles become very tight, then what we found is that they begin to evolve at constant angular momentum. Mm 
the, 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 the clump, the set of particles be, uh, evolves like conserving angular momentum. So this suggested to us that it was not uh, really tidal torques, but just you know interaction with immediate neighbors that do not belong to the set. So basically, so it's just fluid parcels interacting with each other. And so that would correspond, although we haven't really followed the, the terms in the equation, uh, but this suggests it's the, the term related to the eddy viscosity that is responsible for the angular momentum exchange in okay. the clubs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that, I think maybe Gris can summarize, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 sure. So mm -hmm. we have like a few take home messages. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first point is that uh, as, as, we, as we saw, the, the smaller fragments are not the result of the collapse of, of the larger one. So therefore, they only contain a, a fraction of, a, of the total angular momentum of, of the original cloud. So here we, we don't have a, a the conservation problem. Conservation. No? Yeah, actually, mm -hmm. well, maybe there's not a problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the second point is that this a mechanism uh, in which we, we lose both angular momentum and particles that are dispersing is similar again to what is observed in accretion disks, uh, where the material that loses angular momentum moves towards the center of the disk and the material that gains angular momentum goes out. And uh, also, uh, well, uh, that was the last part, the mechanism responsible for this process it does not seem to be related with gravitational torques, but to, to eddy viscosity, that's a, an important point. And finally, what uh, we can see that uh, GHC scenario is consistent with the observations and uh, it provides an understanding of what happens in this uh, angular momentum exchange process mm -hmm. at the scales of molecular clouds to core scales and clumps. So, Maybe that this uh, are the. Maybe I could add there that why why does our this gravitational contraction scenario help understand it? Because uh, as uh, as we can see, the clumps are always all of these clumps are in the process of gravitational contraction, right? Mm -hmm. That's the only way that we can have this mechanism similar to accretion disks. So they are constantly under this you know the desire of contract but they cannot do so unless they sh uh, uh, share or uh, shed some of their angular momentum to this, to this outskirts, or the, to their own outskirts, right? So, but it's essential that the clumps are always trying to contract gravitation. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that sense, that's why we're saying that the, G, the, the gravitation, the global uh, hierarchical uh, contraction scenario uh, is, provides a, a, an adequate uh, background for understanding the mechanism because everything, in this scenario, everything is wanting to collapse, right? And, and, and it's trying, to, it's, it's undergoing collapse, but at the same time, we're understanding it cannot do it as a whole. What we're seeing here is that in order for a clump to contract, it needs to share, to shed part of its material on the outskirts. Uh -huh. And so that's, I guess, yeah. that's more or less the story of our paper, no? <laughs> yeah, the short story. Mm -hmm. Very nice, very nice. Thank you, thank Probably. you. Uh -huh. And Gris and Enrique, thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely article. No, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, actually, I, I wanted to, to thank you for doing this because I think it really wants, uh, it, it really gives the opportunity for people to, to you know, to bring out their papers and, you know, have the community, students. have the community know, um, you know, have more access to them. Yeah. Oh, so, you're welcome. As long as they're all going. <laughs> so, so, you know, our papers are something that we invest an enormous amount mm -hmm. of time and energy. Mm -hmm. right? um, and we never really get a chance to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you give a talk somewhere, you'll cut a figure out from your paper and you'll stick it in the talk. And you, But in a talk, you're, you're trying to get a, a bigger audience or you're trying to make a larger point. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't never really drill down. Um, mm -hmm. uh, 
And so this is at least one opportunity where, you know, we get to talk about the thing we put so much time into. Exactly. <laughs> our our little pets. Detail as you want, right? It's a science paper. It's okay. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a fun venue. I enjoy it. Now, Great let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, sure. uh, where do we go, let's say, over, well, at least until Chris graduates, um, but where do we go over the next, you know, couple of years? Are there additional uh, calculations to be done, either with SPH? Um, uh, are there additional calculations maybe could, could be done with a, a grid type code uh, as if sort of a verification analysis? Are there additional observations that come in? Could you crank up the resolution by a factor of 10, et cetera? <laughs> where, where do we go from here? Okay, okay. Um, well, the next steps, uh, we, we are working on that right now at Auschwitz. Uh, as we see in, in equation eight, where we, we had these other terms, these other contributions, uh -huh. now we would like to quantify the important, uh, the relative importance between uh, those, those terms. Uh -huh. So the next step uh, is to, to make a simulations, uh, simulation without cells gravity and also with magnetic field. So to quantify the gravitational torques and the magnetic torques and also the hydrodynamic torques or these uh, torques by, by pressure gradient, for example. So mm -hmm. that's the next step. Actually, we are working on that. Cool. Uh, we, for, for this time, we, we, we chose another code uh, called Phantom mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it allowed us to, to include magnetic field, but we, do not discard the the idea to to use a, a mesh code, for example, like Arepo. That's it. Yeah. Uh, okay. And in that case, it would be, for example, with uh, passive scalars. No, following the uh, follow instead of tracking the material with the SPH particles, individual particles, we could track it with uh, with uh, passive scalars, for yeah. example. No? Yeah, but. Uh, but yeah, it, it's very interesting. And, and now Greece has been working very, uh, you know, uh, devotedly to uh, <laughs> to getting Phantom to ride, to run in our machines. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. Yeah, and but uh, but we're getting close to the point of running some production simulations. Really? Hopefully, that'll go. That's going to be her second paper. Huh? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's very it. cool. Well, I look forward to seeing that paper in, in the future. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. You on this. Us too. <laughs> momentum and plums. <laughs> uh, that'll do. Enrique Gris, thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely article. And no, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank, you. Mm -hmm. thank you very much. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye bye. <laughs>